Hi, I'm Firefighter Byrne from Salt Spring Island Fire Rescue. Welcome to uh, our Salt Spring Fire online education series. And today we're doing a presentation on FireSmart. So uh, what we're gonna look at today is we're gonna look at fire behavior. Uh, what are the risks to Salt Spring? And how do we as firefighters fight wildfires? And what is FireSmart? And then there, we're gonna give you some things that you can do as an individual or as a community to engage in fire smarting principles for your house or for your community. So uh, we all have seen some of these uh, Hollywood style block blockbuster features where fire is this massive, uh, this wall of flame that moves very, very fast and just devastates everything. Well, fire is very devastating, but it's very rare that it behaves in this fashion. Um, there are some exceptions to that recently, the fires in Australia and the fires in California. Um, they're dealing with ecosystems that are very, very dry, very wind-pushed uh, uh, wind fires, low humidity, extreme heat, and huge fuel loads, eucalyptus and dry grass. So we don't have those kinds of issues here in our ecosystem, but we still face challenges regarding wildfire. Uh, here's a really good aerial photograph of a fire and a graphic that indicates um, how the fire develops and how it moves and, and the labeling system that we use in the fire service and uh, for wildland fire incidents. So you have the head of the fire, which is here, um, the fingers which push out the heel of the fire, which is the back, and what happens when the fire develops uh, enough heat and, and consumes enough fuel, it starts to develop its own weather system and it starts to push uh, firebrand showers ahead of it, creating spot fires. Sometimes for several kilometers ahead of the head of the fire. Uh, the inner portion of the fire is the burnt area, we call that the black. And as you can see, it sort of move, moves out in the perimeter and it moves in the direction of the way the wind's blowing. So not this long line of kilometers and kilometers of fire, but more of a uh, sort of like a ripple effect of a rock in a pond that kind of spreads outwards. Um, this is a graphic describing the movement of the fire and how it reacts to what it encounters in terms of fuel and the impact it's going to have on your house um, as it uh, approaches the area and as it throws firebrands and fire shower, uh, brand showers towards the house. So you have uh, the development of the fire. Most fires, as most people are aware of, are human caused, um, either by undoused campfires, improperly doused campfires, burn piles that get away from people, or smoking materials that are improperly disposed of. Um, so the fire starts to develop, it smolders in the uh, surface level, subsurface level, develops more heat, starts to consume more fuel, and then it grows and becomes uh, an incipient fire. And it starts to move, consuming more fuel as it moves, heating up, generating more heat, and then radiating heat in front of it to the materials ahead of it and moving slightly faster because things ignite more quickly once they're heated. And then it pushes towards more fuel, and we have a, a graphic of a deciduous tree here. De deciduous trees generally are less flammable unless they're dead or, and have uh, dead leaves around the base. Uh, and coniferous trees, as they indicate, are much more flammable, uh, especially if they're dead. And we can see nowadays that there's uh, problems with some of our cedars. They're dying out because of lack of moisture, the extreme weather changes that we're experiencing. Uh, the, tr the firewood moves along into this fuel area and below the tree we often see branches that are dead lower down and what happens is the surface level fire starts to climb up the tree. We call that ladder fuel. So it climbs up the tree like a ladder and then it gets into the canopy and then we have a real issue because then it's now a canopy fire that's wind driven and jumps from, from treetop to treetop. Now it's sending ember showers towards your house and if you've ever looked at your house I, I encourage you to do this is to look at where all the leaves collect, all the debris, pine needles uh, and, and dead leaves and branches and so on. And you'll find that they, they end up in the valleys of the roof, uh, the eaves troughs, around the, uh, the deck areas and stairways underneath, uh, if you don't have a skirted deck, underneath the deck and so on. And that's where the ember showers are being pushed into, the same areas that your debris is pushed into by the wind. So one of the fire smarting principles is to clear all that debris away from uh, the house, at least a perimeter of 1.5 meters, and to clear away your uh, debris off the roof. Clear your valleys, clear the eaves troughs, uh, clear any debris around the house, under the decks, 
if you can, skirting your deck is a very, very advisable thing to do. Uh, make sure your fence line isn't touching the structure. And wood piles, make sure they are away from the house as well. And once they are away from the house, make sure they're kept clean. Um, you know, raking away uh, dead debris, uh, bark and so on. Uh, just flammable debris away from your wood pile. Uh, this is going to basically minimize the risk of a wildfire. Fire is very opportunistic and behaviorally. What it wants to do is find easy fuel and move through an area quite quickly. If you limit the amount of fuel, the fire is basically going to look for an easier path. Uh, so uh, this is a, a really good graphic to indicate that, how it moves, how it develops, how it goes into a canopy, and then how it radiates heat and pushes uh, ember showers towards your house. Uh, very good photographs that express this, the concept in the last graphic, which is, this is a huge, impressive ember shower, and these, both these houses, by all indications, look like they've had uh, firebrands land on the roof, Potentially there was debris on the roof that ignited because as you can see around the property, it's still green and unimpinged by fire. Uh, same here, the lawn is not burned. There's a live tree here. The truck is, is hardly touched. There's some stuff that's dropped down. So it looks like firebrands have landed in areas along the eaves troughs areas on the deck. And as I indicated earlier, under this deck, it's unskirted. There was potentially debris under there that ignited, ignites the deck and there you go. Uh, furniture along the deck line. Many of us have uh, plastic furniture on the deck, uh, combustible things on the deck, barbecues, propane tanks, all that stuff needs to come away if you want to mitigate the risk of, of your house burning up in a wildfire event. So that's also a fire smarting principle. You, you want to triage your home and remove everything that's possibly, uh, that can possibly light up in a fire situation and ignite your house. Uh, I talked about wood piles, the effective way to stack them and keeping them away from the house. And if you uh, uh, have, if you check our website, uh, our firefighter Warren Nunes did a presentation on burning it clean, which uh, uh, shows you how to do things right at home, how to season your wood properly, and how to have an effective wood fire at home, creating less smoke and just effective burning. Now, wildfires like this, it's looking for effective burning. It's looking for small bits of kindling, dry wood, debris. So if that stuff's close to your house, it's going to, it's going to ignite much more readily than a densely packed, uh, clean uh, stack of wood away from the house. So you want to keep that stuff stored. At our place, we actually do have a steel box that kindling is stored in next to the wood pile so that it's, there's no risk of, of uh, ignition of that stuff. A uh, photograph of a huge fire event, uh, and basically it's moving very rapidly, and the aftermath is this. The fires found fuel and just basically moved through very rapidly uh, with a lot of devastation. Uh, a couple of fire photographs here. This first one is uh, Lizard Lake in Port Renfrew, which was 2015, and it was 402 hectares. And you can see, uh, if you remember the graphic that we had at the beginning with the uh, the diagram of the fire, you can see the heel, the flanks, and some fingers going out and the head pushing forward, wind driven. Um, a very, very good photograph. And this one was Dog Mountain in Port Alberni in 2015, 450 hectares. Uh, very steep terrain. It's uh, being driven up off the lake and it's sending firebrands forward and creating spot fires in this area here. So um, obviously steep topography is a, um, a very dangerous uh, situation in, in wildfire events because fire travels very rapidly uphill. Okay, so our coastal ecosystem is primarily Douglas fir and, and on the forest floor we have a lot of fire resistant plants such as sword ferns and salal. Um, a lot of water content in the in the leaves of these plants and they're very fire resistant. They're designed to resist events um, because uh, fire is cyclical in, in the coastal uh, ecosystem. It's about an 80 to 85 year cycle and uh, just as a contrast in the Okanagan it's a uh, ponderosa pine primarily and that's a uh, 10 year cycle. Um, Douglas fir, very very thick bark uh, which is fire resistant um, and also the older Douglas fir, the more mature Douglas fir drop their uh, dead branches below about five meters if they're over 80 years old. So um, thus eliminating ladder fuels. 
So the problems we run into here in the coastal region is that with the wildland urban interface, we have um, uh, added other plants into the ecosystem. We've cleared stuff and also the result of windstorms and so on, we have debris on the ground, which is, is volatile and flammable. So that is a risk and, and something that we have to deal with. Uh, and that is basically an indication of the possibility of a, of a huge event in 1938, uh, 290 uh, square kilometers in Sayward, uh, from Campbell River almost all the way to Courtney, a uh, huge fire. The uh, Canadian Navy and the British Navy were off the coast in the strait uh, there to evacuate people if it was necessary. Fortunately, it was not. Two ships actually crashed in the uh, strait because the visibility was so poor because of the smoke. Um, so these larger fires are possible in the coastal region. We have to be aware of that and not get complacent and, and think, oh no, it's only going to happen in areas in, in the interior where it's super dry and grassy and with pine and so on. It can happen here. We have to be careful. <clears throat> okay, some coastal fires here in BC. Nanaimo Lakes in 2018, that was 180 hectares, and uh, Tugwell Creek in Souk, uh, smaller one, 83 hectares, or slightly bigger actually, 83 hectares, and that was also in 2018. And you can also see the way the fire is moving, the flanks, the heel, and the head moving forward, and it's got its plume going. Same here, very, very good uh, indication of that graphic. S slow moving, but they, uh, the ability to fight these fires is quite difficult because of the remoteness and getting in there. So the, the main strategy is confinement, like building fire breaks or using existing fire breaks to contain the fire and allowing it to burn itself out. Some local fires. Uh, this is Salt Spring Fire right here fighting a fire. Uh, I'm not sure where this one is exactly, but this is an indication how, how things go here. Uh, there's a lot of surface fire in here and then it meets a tree and Douglas fir here, no lower lying ladder fuel, so it's fairly contained. And what happens here is that um, we have maybe a, a, a period of time where the fire develops, it's smoldering, and then it starts to move slowly, developing heat as I indicated in the uh, graphic slide at the beginning. And then it grows and people are very, very diligent in this community about reporting uh, smoke sightings or even smells. So we're able to actually attack these fires quite quickly and, and contain them. So uh, this one was Galliano. It was uh, 60 plus hectares and um, it uh, was quite quite a, an event for the Gulf Islands, uh, quite a large fire. They used, uh, as you can see, the Mars bomber. Um, so these events are possible in a Gulf Island environment. Another uh, graphic of a, or a photograph of a fire here on Salt Spring. Um, these fires, we get to uh, contain them quite quickly, but they're very tenacious. They go into the subsurface, into root systems, into stumps, and they're very, very difficult to completely uh, put out. So it takes a lot of time and effort. Uh, it's quite a task. So we do have to be diligent in watching how we burn and uh, respecting the, the burn bands and making sure that we're, we control our smoking material very carefully. Okay, this is a... Uh, they call it the Salt Spring Wildfire Protection Plan. Basically, it's a map of the island showing the, the areas of hazard. Obviously, red is the highest hazard, yellow, intermediate, and green, uh, uh, low risk. And the reason for increased risk is, as, as we all are aware of, there has been an increase in extreme weather patterns um, worldwide, but it's very evident here in the province. Much, much hotter summers, much drier, and uh, high, much, much higher risk of wildfire. Um, on Salt Spring, we have these, uh, Highly elevated areas, so hillsides with uh, the possibility of wind-driven fire up hillsides is a quite a high risk, and there's very limited water supply and access to those areas. And also, um, some of these areas are outside the jurisdiction of, of the Salt Spring Fire Department, so we would work in, in uh, tandem with uh, the BC Wildfire Service to fight fires in that area. Uh, they have a fire base in Maple Bay, and they have been over on the island uh, a couple of times helping out. Um, what else do we have? Poor water supply. Yes, uh, so in order to fight fire in these areas, there's no hydranting in these areas. We would have to shuttle water uh, from uh, other sources into that area in order to fight. So the best strategy for us is containment and structural protection. Uh, and exactly, limited resources. There aren't that many uh, vehicles and apparatus here 
to do that work and firefighters to uh, to be able to cover an event that's island wide or fairly well developed in some section of the island. So uh, this one, how do we fight fire? I, I brought it up briefly in the last picture. Um, we basically are structural firefighters. We stay on the roads mostly and we protect structures. So if there's a wildfire event happening, uh, we will uh, create a line of containment. And basically the presentation is on FireSmart. We're trying to encourage communities to, to uh, as much as possible, uh, create an environment around their home that's uh, less amenable to fire. And that actually assists us a great deal in terms of protecting communities. Uh, we would also do things like setting up portable tanks uh, and helping to set up sprinkler systems in homes uh, to basically create, um, they call it a humidity bubble around the house bank and, and basically uh, creating a, an area where the fire is less likely to go because there's less fuel, there's more moisture and it's going to find another path. Uh, this is one of our tenders up in Williams Lake filling up a tank portable tank here with uh, hose lines going to the sprinkler system and this is a BC wildfire service crew uh, doing a back burn so what they'll do is they'll, they have guard here a fire guard and they're going to do a controlled burn to burn off the fuel so that the fire has nowhere to go um, it's very uh, it's very challenging the uh, wildland urban interface situation where you have houses dotted through forest communities and uh, it's a very, very challenging situation. And if uh, more communities engage in fire smarting principles for their homes, then we've created a, much more of an effective fire break. Um, and, and it's effective for all of us working together as, as a community. Uh, this is an indication of that. Uh, <clears throat> we have um, the fires moved through here and there's a house that survived. And I, I mean, I can't accurately say exactly why. Perhaps it was because they had cleared their roof line. There was no, uh, nothing combustible along the side of the house and so on. So, but this is uh, Dr. Jack Cohn, who worked with the uh, BC or the uh, American Department of Agriculture and their wildfire service. Uh, done, they've done countless studies on the movement of wildfire and why it is it that some places survive and some don't. don't. And they came up with uh, the idea that if there is no fuel load around certain uh, around your house and there's another avenue more fuel loaded somewhere closer by or in the next area but that's the way the fire is going to move so uh, very effective uh, it's a very effective principle to use in terms of home protection so what's fire smart we've already uh, discussed some of the uh, some of the elements of what fire smart is and it's also these principles of how you garden um, how you clean up the debris around your home the types of plant choices you make, the perimeter you leave around your home, first the 1.5 meter, and then as, as we'll discuss further on in this presentation, there's certain uh, perimeters around the house, first 1.5, 10, and so on. We'll discuss that. Uh, these plants are not highly combustible, lots of water content, uh, deciduous trees, trees away from the house, and you want to clear debris around, like all the leaves and dead branches and so on, to uh, eliminate uh, fuel load for the fire coming through. Okay, so this is the slide that I was talking about. You've got your house in the middle. You want uh, initially, as I indicated, a 1.5 meter perimeter around the house. So no bark mulch, no leaves, no debris at all. Clear the, the eaves troughs and the valleys on the roof of any debris. Um, furniture, uh, combustible furniture close to the house and stuff. If there's a wildfire situation coming in, you are gonna have time to do that final triage of your house, like take the lawn furniture or the uh, deck furniture and throw it into the middle of the lawn and clear away anything that can combust against the house. So what you want in the inner per the uh, 1.5, as I said, and then the 10 meter area, which is mostly uh, clear of trees, if possible, like people do ask like, well, I've got trees there, I'm not gonna cut everything down. Well, you could start by a, clearing all the debris on the ground, keeping your lawn short, uh, very short, and then limbing uh, trees up, up the uh, stems so that there's no ladder fuel available. And you also don't want uh, branch and leaf impingement on your roof from trees that are close to the house. You might want to trim those back as well. 
And that actually works really well for uh, pest control, actually, as well. Okay, so outside of the 10 meter perimeter, same, similar idea. You want to clear brush from between the trees, limb up uh, at least two to three meters up from the ground. And then as you get further out, uh, you can still have trees, but you don't want, uh, you also don't want the crowns touching. You want a uh, three meter separation between the tips of the trees so that the fire doesn't jump. jump. And then at the 30, between the 30 to 100 meter mark, that's fine because the amount, even if it's a big wildland event, the heat generally won't radiate more than 100 feet. You may get the, the firebrand showers that I was talking about, but if you've uh, uh, followed the fire smart principles carefully, the chances of that uh, becoming a huge event is, is uh, negligible. And also if you uh, decide to use sprinklers to protect your property further, that's going to even minimize the risk further. Um, People do ask me, well, I don't have 30 meters in, in my property between myself and the neighbor. Well, you have to work with what you have. Um, we're in a similar situation where I live. Uh, the space between the properties is about 20 to 30 feet. And basically what we've done is we've um, used all the fire smarting principles around the close proximity to the house and um, done the best we can under the circumstances. And I do chat over the fence with the neighbor. He's very interested about what we're doing. And I think, uh, you know, soon he's, he's going to uh, be interested in following some principles. The other thing is, if a fire does move through there, um, the likelihood of it blasting through a place that's been protected versus the place next door that isn't, is, it's likely that it will travel to the easiest, the easiest path it can find. Okay, more on fire smart gardening. We do have... Uh, these pamphlets, unfortunately, because we're in an isolation situation, uh, you don't have access to that. But if you go to, um, there will be some uh, website information at the end of the presentation. You go to those websites, there is a lot of information, home surveys and so on, that you can um, peruse through, do a, an assessment for your home and get some ideas about how to effectively uh, fire smart garden. So obviously very uh, plants with high moisture content, uh, rock gardening features rather than the use of, of uh, wood chips and so on. Yeah, uh, another just uh, reinforcing the idea of clearing debris away, you know, keeping the grass short and uh, you, the choice of trees, the distance from the house, make sure you're limbing up and, and removing all the debris. And this is a very good indication, these two photographs, the this photograph there's tons of debris nothing's been limbed that's just a, a very very uh, fertile area for wildfire just to rip through and what they've done over here they've limbed up and cleared the debris on the ground uh, spaced some of the trees out cut some of the smaller trees out space it out quite nicely uh, this is a problem we have here on salt spring the, the broom uh, it's very volatile extremely flammable and uh, it's quite a problem. On hillsides, wind-driven fires can develop quite, quite quickly and move quite quickly. Um, so it's, it's very important to uh, try and get rid of this. Uh, unfortunately, as I said, we're in an isolation uh, situation right now, but uh, every year Salt Spring Fire usually runs a, uh, a cut bloom and broom and uh, chipping uh, event at uh, the fire halls. Not this year, unfortunately. Um, however, uh, there are some other methods you can use to control things, maybe uh, cut things down, uh, engage in berming or hugel culture uh, development for plant beds and so on. Um, quite challenging to deal with this stuff. Uh, this isn't a garden, obviously, but it's what they're trying to indicate in this slide. It's like tall dead grass and debris and stuff is highly volatile, very flammable and uh, potentially very high risk for your house. This is a beautifully fire smart uh, lawn here, very short, it's all very green, and it's going around the whole perimeter of the house. They've got a garden and uh, they've worked within the confines of what they have. Obviously beyond that maybe isn't their property, and, uh, but within their own confines, they've done a really good job. This is kind of what you want things to look like if you do have a lawn. If not, maybe you want to work with the rock feature stuff or um, uh, succulent plants, 
uh, plants with high water content, ferns, and so on. Uh, there's a very good list uh, on the websites at the end of the of the presentation that um, give a list of plants that are very effective in um, reducing the risk of wildfire. Dead leaves on the ground, yes, very uh, very volatile, highly combustible. You want to clear that stuff away. Trees like pine and juniper are very volatile as well. You want to try and reduce having those in your in your property. And using native plants, salal, uh, gary oaks, and, and sword ferns, it's very effective. And if you really want to go with a whole hog nine yards, you can start some zero scaping, desert style um, uh, landscaping, which is uh, pl plants with high water content that require very little watering. So not only are you fire smarting your property, but you're reducing the consumption of water. Um, okay, another reiteration of making sure your roots clean. Uh, having many people, uh, well, there are still roots that are cedar shingled. Uh, you know, people say, well, I'm not replacing my roof. I don't have the money to do that. Well, what you can do to minimize risk is at, at least keep it clean, remove the moss from the roof, make sure the eaves are clear. And then make sure your soffits are um, are not don't have large openings so that firebrands can get inside or ember showers. These are also very dangerous. The gable vents, uh, embers will blow inside the attic and cause fire inside the attic. What you want to do with that, if you have these at your home, is pull the slats off and put a fine mesh metal screen or steel screen in there and then put everything back together. That prevents embers from entering the, the attic space. Okay, uh, open burning. It's been banned in the province uh, during the COVID-19 situation for health reasons. Uh, it's, it puts people that have respiratory issues and people who are ill at, at higher risk. So um, you can go to the government website to get information on that, keep yourself updated. But uh, there's a a fire ban right now for burning. You're still able to have campfires, um, but uh, you do need a permit for those, and you can get one of those online uh, from Salt Spring Fire's website. Um, burn piles do have a tendency to get away from people. We've had several fires on the island uh, over the years where uh, a burn pile has been uh, not managed uh, well. It gets out of control. They don't have the suppression um, uh, methods in place like an extinguisher and a hose so you need to be very aware of that burn hot and clean and small if you can so but as I indicated no burning also a very good uh, photograph of the uh, environmental risks of burning uh, green material you never want to burn anything hydrocarbon like uh, rubber or plastic anything at all paints um, it has to be cured cured material at least for three months and then you won't end up with this kind of um, environmental smoke pollution, which is very dangerous in the times we live in right now with the uh, COVID situation. So as I was saying, alternatives to burning uh, earlier on, and there are a few. You can start, uh, this is a Hugel culture, and basically what it is is piling up debris underneath and dirt and organic material like your compost, and then dirt on top, and then actually just planting uh, your material in the top, basically elevated garden beds. So it takes care of that. The, the materials that you put underneath decompose nicely and uh, give a lot of nutrients to the plants that you're growing. There's also berming, which is basically your organic material logs and brambles and stuff are in contact with soil, covered with soil, and uh, it takes care of the issue and it also helps the wood and the debris decompose and makes it less of a fire risk. As I mentioned earlier too, pine and bark mulch uh, um, looks great around the property and around trees and plants, but it is very volatile when it gets hot like it does here in the summer. And as uh, our extreme weather conditions increase, uh, this becomes a lot more of a risk. It, it uh, combusts very quickly. Uh, I've seen several fires where just the dispose of so smoking material in the bark mulch causes it to smolder and eventually ignite. You want to, uh, Maintain that 1.5 meter combustible free perimeter around your building. So the alternatives are maybe gravel or de decorative rock. And if that's not something that suits your fancy, just compress dirt even. Or uh, you can do uh, have some plants that are high, of high water content close to the house as well. That's fine. Um, 
but yeah, definitely not the uh, bark or the pine mulch. Sprinklers are very effective. Uh, so you've done all the fire smarting. This property looks beautiful. Um, they've really short grass here. Everything looks clean and cleared away. There is some furniture here um, that if an event is approaching that can be cleared out, put into the, on, into the middle of the lawn. They've set up their systems here to create a humidity bubble and, and to uh, minimize the risk of the fire coming through here. Um, we do sell these or these uh, sprinklers. They're uh, wasp sprinklers um, and they're very effective. You hook them up to your water source and uh, mount them in the gutters, the roof gutters, or you can customize them by putting a piece of 2x4 and mounting them on uh, either side of the peak of the roof. Uh, make sure you get assistance doing that, have a professional come and do that uh, so things are done safely. Oh, this is very interesting, up in uh, Burns Lake uh, during the uh, forest fire season of 2018, what the farmers were doing was cutting their fields very, very low, uh, cutting the grass very, very short, and then digging uh, a guard around their hay or their equipment, their vehicles and so on, very effective way to to minimize the risk of the fire impinging on their farms. Here it's similar in this field, very green, so this is a very low risk of, of ignition, but they've also, just in case it dries out, done a, a guard around their field. So what else can we do to help out? We can set up info sessions. Uh, when things settle down for us here and we're able to go out again, uh, we're happy to do uh, fire smart presentations to community groups and pods. Um, we're also uh, looking at uh, the possibility of a government grant coming down to do a, a, com a community chipping. Um, so keep, uh, keep yourself posted on that. Uh, check the Cell Spring website and that hopefully will be happening sometime in the near future. And basically how it would work is a certain amount of money would be uh, granted to Salt Spring and then a, uh, a chipping company would go around the island and, and chip uh, community by community. You can also combine forces with your neighbors in the community and, and uh, uh, reduce the cost of chipping by sharing the expenses. Uh, the fire prevention officer here at Salisbury is always willing to uh, take phone calls and answer questions and, and uh, occasionally do site assessments for, for members in the community and pods. So as I was talking about, there's, uh, there's some of the resources, uh, FireSmart BC, FireSmart Canada, there's some very good information uh, about home surveys. You can do a survey and see how your house rates and see what you can do to improve your rating. So one step at a time. And uh, you can watch this and other videos at saltspringfire.com. Thank you very much for your attention and I uh, look forward to seeing you in person sometime in the future. Thank you.